Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, we are going to go ahead and start our next session. Um, and um, let's see, our next session is going to be Housing 101 for lawyers serving the LGBTQ plus community during COVID-19. Um, and I will say that this is an area where we get a ton of questions at our legal clinic. So I am really thrilled to be joined by Matt Woods, who is a staff attorney at the Northwest Justice Project and who I have been working with for and had the pleasure of knowing for several years. Um, and Matt is just a really um, deeply knowledgeable and deeply compassionate person um, that is a real asset to our, our legal community. So um, it's just a, a real pleasure that Matt said yes when I asked him to join us. Um, if we have time, this session will go until uh, until 2.20. Um, if we have time, if Matt finishes, if and we have time, I will touch on some, um, some rights related to unsheltered and unhoused LGBTQ folks, but because we get many more questions on landlord-tenant law than we do folks who are unhoused, and we have a, a whole housing resource, or excuse me, a legal resource for unhoused folks, I want to give Matt as much time as he needs. So we will go until about 2.20 um, and, um, and then we'll have one more session before the end of the day after that. All right, take it away, Matt. Thank you, Denise, for that very generous introduction. Can you hear me? Great, and can you see my slides on the screen? Excellent. Uh, again, my name is Matt Woods. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a staff attorney at the Northwest Justice Project. I've been practicing housing law there for about five years now. <clears throat> uh, I'm certainly no expert, but I'm happy to present today. I'm happy to answer any questions that we have along the way. I'm not particular about how they come in, whether you want to put them in the chat or whether you want to just unmute yourself and interrupt. Feel free at any time. I'm happy to answer questions. And if I don't have the answers right away, I am happy to go to the brain trust of Washington attorneys that I have all around me at my organization and others and get answers and uh, come back to you with those. Okay, so a quick outline of what we'll be covering today. I'm going to start with the Residential Landlord Tenant Act, which defines uh, who is covered by this act and the protections that they have um, within it. Uh, next, I'll do a little bit of time on fair housing. And lastly, some new le housing legislation just within the past year that's given tenants some additional protections that we're really happy about as advocates for tenants. Uh, it's going to be real kind of surface level information because I don't quite have the time to go in much depth. Um, but again, feel free to answer any sp or ask any specific questions that you have along the way. Um, and I can get into, into more specifics that way. Uh, apologies if I'm just kind of breezing over a lot of information, but I'm going to try to get as much packed in as I can, although I anticipate having time for questions at the end and time for Denise to cover some additional material. Okay, I am starting with a block of text from the statutory text because what uh, presentation doesn't have a great wall of statutory text in it, um, but I've put this up to this the definitions of who's covered by the RLTA, the Residential Landlord Tenant Act, uh, to get a baseline about who we're talking about here and to show you that it's, it's fairly broad as far as who is included and gets these protections, although there are some exceptions that I'll be covering next. So a tenant is to simply define as any person entitled to occupy a dwelling unit, uh, primarily for living or dwelling purposes under a rental agreement. Dwelling unit is defined as a structure, any part of that structure which is used as a home, a residence, or sleeping place by one person or two or more, maintaining a common household. Um, and so that can be renting a room within a house. Um, that can be... Um, You'll see that at the end of that definition, renting a mobile home, although note that for mobile home owners, there is a different set of laws, but for a person who might be renting somebody else's mobile home, has a standard apartment, rents a floor in a house, rents even a room uh, in a common house. Um, the, the all falls within the definitions here. And you'll see lastly that rental agreements, all agreements which establish or modify the terms, conditions, rules, regulations, or any other provisions concerning the use of a dwelling unit. Um, and so you'll note there that that doesn't say that it has to be in writing. Um, so a verbal agreement uh, to um, live in a dwelling unit uh, and to pay rent to live there uh, can qualify you for protections under the Residential Landlord Tenant Act. 
Now, in most cases, it's going to be preferable for tenants to be trying to get some kind of rental agreement in writing, uh, just because if and when anything goes sour, it's so much better to have that piece of writing to refer to about what the terms were, what the rent was, um, how long you were allowed to be there, et cetera. And so um, I know in kind of group home situations or other home, uh, other kind of uh, like subletting or um, becoming a new roommate uh, to a person who, pri uh, who previously has a rental agreement, we might see clients in those kind of situations here and there. Um, while they may be uh, still covered by the RLTA, uh, it's going to be easier to make sure that they that they have and can enforce those rights if they are able to get something in writing. Of course, you know, that's all based on the individual circumstances about what they might want to consider about uh, the nature of the owner or the landlord and why that might be difficult for them. But generally speaking, it's going to be better to get something in writing, although again, it's, it's not required. Uh, the one thing I want to point out here, too, about um, who's covered by the RLTA, um, you'll note that it does not cover people who voluntarily are uh, uh, offered to, to move into um, a person's home, um, but do not pay rent. Um, and so uh, part of the rental agreement would be that, that there's some kind of payment happening for, um, for being able to have use of the dwelling. Um, and so they'd be... Uh, what's defined as a tenant at will and has some fewer protections, unfortunately, for people who move into a home um, and they are offered the ability to move into that home and to live there for a time, um, but don't pay any rent for doing so. Who else is not covered by the RLTA? There are some living arrangements exempted by a particular RCW, and I want to point those out because they can um, be where uh, many of our clients uh, might often be living. Residence in an institution where that residence is incidental to education or services. So that's going to include dorms um, at college universities, colleges and universities. Uh, most shelters, particularly religious ones, are often going to argue um, and often try to put into writing when people uh, uh, begin living there that their residence might be incidental to the services they're getting there. Um, uh, whether uh, particularly religious um, <clears throat> shelters. And so there's still room for advocacy that, you know, considering all the circumstances that um, some people uh, in shelters may still have protections under the RLTA, <clears throat> particularly if they pay what might be called like a monthly like fee. Um, you know, I see some kind of shelters trying to get around this idea that, uh, that a person pays rent and therefore has rights as a tenant there by saying, you know, no, your residence is incidental to the services that we can offer you. Um, and, and this fee that you pay every month isn't your rent. Um, we, we still obviously want to advocate that no matter what you call it, if it, rent is rent. Um, and so there's still some room to argue in those kind of situations, but, but that's something to watch out for um, when you're talking to clients who, um, who are spending time in shelters. Uh, and also recovery houses are exempted uh, from the RLTA. They have their own laws that I'm certainly happy to answer any questions about if you come across those cases um, in particular. Motels and hotels are exempted from the Residential Landlord Tenant Act. Um, but something I should point out here is that I'm, as I'm going over who's exempted from the RLTA, this is a little bit separate from who has protections right now during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic um, under city and state moratoria that offered expanded protections to tenants who wouldn't ordinarily fall under the RLTA. Motels and hotels are a big example of that. A person who'd been staying in a motel or hotel for 14 days or more had some protections under um, the city of Seattle moratorium or the statewide moratorium that's now kind of on a, what we call a bridge um, that, that will go back to, to standard landlord tenant law. Um, they had protections even though they wouldn't fall under the RLTA. Uh, the last point I have here is housing provided to employees whose occupancy is conditioned on employment. So this might be a person who works at a, a shelter, a group home, um, or a standard apartment building, but is working there as a manager or um, in, in some kind of capacity is employed by the owner of that property. And their, their ability to live there is conditioned on continuing to be an employee there then they may not be covered by the RLTA. And so you may want to, to watch out for situations like that. 
duties of the landlord. These are just some basics. Um, but one thing that I that I always that just comes right to mind when I start talking about duties of landlords and duties of tenants is they're both written into the law. But we know the power imbalance that landlords have over tenants. And so when tenants fail to fulfill their duties, landlords have um, some pretty uh, handy things at their fingertips to be able to deal with that, namely um, trying to evict, you know, sending notices of eviction and trying to go to court to remove someone um, from their rental um, or other, you know, even illegal retaliatory practices, but they have, you know, that ability because of the power imbalance to make life a lot harder for a tenant that a tenant does not have when a landlord does not fulfill their duties. Um, the tenant just has some remedies, but they're a lot harder to access. And just the nature of the power imbalance is that it's much more difficult to get a landlord to perform the duties they have under the law if they are choosing not to. And so I'll talk about, you know, some, some remedies there are and some strategies around that. But that is the, the harsh reality of being tenant advocates. And unfortunately is, <clears throat> is definitely a skill that needs to be developed in speaking with tenants is, um, is setting proper expectations and simultaneously wanting to be a fierce advocate for them and telling them the things that you can and will do to advocate advocate for their rights while setting proper expectations um, about what realistic outcomes are and, and how unfair that is and how unjust that is in many, many cases, um, but that, that is a reality um, for many tenants. Um, so with that, um, with that kind of buzzkill notice <laughs> before I go into the duties of the landlord, um, here are, are some of the main ones that I picked out. They are the duties to maintain the property in accordance with applicable codes, to maintain the structure of the property, roof, walls, appliances, heat, and water. And I'll talk a little bit more about what remedies are when that doesn't happen, to keep um, common areas clean and sanitary, safe from defects, to provide a program for control of infestation by insects, rodents, other pests, um, <clears throat> I kind of loop in mold with this too, which is unfortunately a problem in a lot of Washington state and in the Seattle area. Uh, and lastly, to make repairs when needed. And I'll get back to <clears throat> what tenants can do when that's not happening in a moment. I'm gonna go first to the duties of tenants are to keep the unit in good condition, not damage the premises, the fixtures, the appliances, not to commit a nuisance or engage in drug related criminal activities not to endanger other tenants or staff. At the end of the tenancy to return the unit to the condition it was in at the start, less normal wear and tear. I'll talk a little bit more about that too. Basically to follow the lease, to follow all the terms that are in the lease uh, with, you know, as I was saying earlier, <clears throat> the landlord's ability to serve a notice on a tenant um, that a landlord believes is not fulfilling these duties that could possibly start the timeline towards eviction, what's called an unlawful detainer action in Washington state. And so that is the power that landlords hold uh, but over their tenants <coughs> who they believe are not performing these duties. Um, the last thing I have on here is obvious. It says pay rent, but I put it with an exclamation point and I save it for last to note another kind of um, uh, I think really unfortunate way about the, the way that the Residential Landlord uh, Tenant Act is written in that the duty of a tenant to pay rent is is entirely separate from um, uh, and, 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 the, and the tenant still has that duties regardless of whether the landlord is fulfilling their own duties. And so something that a tenant does not have that would be nice to have, to have the power to hold over a landlord is, oh, if a landlord's not doing their job, then I shouldn't have to pay rent. And that's that seems really instinctual and that um, makes sense to a lot of clients. And you may meet with some clients who are thinking about doing that or who have already done that. And that makes sense. Um, but unfortunately, it's not the law. The law really separates those duties and requires a tenant to continue to pay rent if they want the use of the dwelling unit and, and not to be under threat of eviction, despite many, many other problems that might be happening with the unit or with the relationship with the landlord. Um, and so that is an unfortunate part of the power imbalance here too. Um, some notes about payment of rent. The landlord uh, cannot apply rent payments to anything other than rent. And that's a recent change in the law. And it's really beneficial to a lot of our 
um, clients, particularly in times of COVID, when people, you know, may be struggling to to keep up with with uh, rent and other costs that they may be having that are piling on. <clears throat> Fortunately, during the moratorium, uh, late fees were not allowed. But as that phases out, and clients are still trying to get caught up and maybe even incurring new late fees. Um, one thing that is beneficial is that the, the law says a landlord cannot apply rent payments to anything but the rent. And a reason why that kind of makes a difference, you'll see here in the last bullet point, is that a tenant cannot be evicted for non-payment of any amount that isn't rent. And so those other fees you know, can build up. Um, but if a tenant's continuing to try to pay rent payments to keep up with their rent and they don't have the extra funds to be able to address late fees, attorney's fees that they may have had from previously in the, in the tenancy for whatever reason or some other cost that's not rent, a landlord cannot evict now based on non-payment of those amounts. Um, and so uh, that's something to strategize with, with clients about as they're getting caught up, um, particularly um, after, after COVID-19. Now, rent may include utilities. If utilities are paid directly to the landlord, then they would fall within the definition of rent, even though they are separated out. Uh, if the tenant pays utilities to the utility companies directly, um, then a landlord can't hold a tenant responsible in any way for being behind in utilities that's you know, between the tenant and the utility company. Uh, if a tenant pays in cash, the landlord must give a receipt. Uh, and it's never appropriate for a tenant to withhold rent in order to get the landlord to act, as I talked about a little bit earlier, um, as much as that might seem intuitive uh, to a lot uh, to, to renters like myself. <laughs> Okay, repairs is a bit of a, of a complicated in-depth issue under the law and there's a statute that, that outlines some very specific procedures that tenants would need to go through when their landlord aren't performing necessary repairs um, that are the landlord's duty. I've got a little bit of an overview here, but I am so happy to answer uh, more detailed questions about this, um, you know, either during the presentation today or after I've got my contact info at the end of this um, slide presentation. Feel free to reach out to me because I know that this is a really common um, issue for a lot of renters and COVID-19 kind of accelerated a lot of these problems with landlords perhaps being less willing to fulfill their duties to provide a habitable rental for their tenants, um, particularly when their tenants have not been able to keep up with rent. And so generally speaking, when a repair is needed to a rental unit, the tenant needs to provide the landlord or the person who collects rent written notice of the defective condition. And this is where the law is a bit old school still and written notice means in writing. And so as much as uh, it's common for a landlord and tenant maybe to text, uh, to email, um, just to be absolutely doubly safe if it comes to the, if it ever comes to the point where a court's having to evaluate, did a tenant give proper written notice um, about this repair issue, your tenants are gonna wanna be extra safe by actually putting something in writing, you know, delivering a, hand, a copy by hand to the landlord if they might live in the same house, sending it to the address they have for them and, and keeping a copy for themselves to be able to show you know, a dated copy that they did that. Um, if they don't have the landlord's address for whatever reason, which seems you know, increasingly common as just landlords and tenants are, you know, have relationships by text or email and, and nothing's ever sent by mail anymore. Um, if they're really having trouble getting access to a landlord's uh, address where something in writing could be sent. Um, uh, one thing that I like to do for tenants uh, is to go to the county assessor's site and enter the property address because that will have to have some kind of information, some kind of contact information for um, the owner uh, of that property. So there should be some address listed there. Who knows, you know, whether they actually check that address or, um, you know, uh, if they live that address or, or if it's a business address, no matter what it is, at least then a tenant can say, you know, they've gone through their good faith duty of sending something in writing to an address that the, the owner has listed publicly. Um, and so that's a, that's a good way to do that. Okay, so you send a notice in writing <clears throat> of the defective condition. A landlord has these kind of time frames to correct these different kinds of issues. 24 hours if it deprives a tenant of hot or cold water, heat or electricity, or is imminently hazardous to life. 72 hours for use of a refrigerator, range and oven, other major plumbing fixture that's supplied by the landlord. All other cases are 10 days. 
And that is for <clears throat> the landlord to begin the work um, fixing the issue. It doesn't necessarily mean that the work needs to be completed then, but that's when the landlord needs to begin <clears throat> reasonably addressing the issue, getting it fixed. Now uh, you'll see here at the bottom, if repair work is delayed due to circumstances beyond the landlord's control, including even the unavailability of financing, the landlord shall remedy the defective condition as soon as possible. <clears throat> so that's what the law says about when a landlord needs to start fixing the, the issue. In real life, do landlords not follow through with that all the time? and especially it seems during times like COVID-19. And so <clears throat> here are the tenant options when a landlord does not make the repair after the tenant has provided the written notice and waited the requisite amount of time. Now I'm gonna skip right to the bottom here because this is a unfortunate truth that was already um, really damaging to a lot of tenants and their ability to get repairs even before COVID-19, but is that much more of a problem now as so many renters are behind in rent. These options in the law <clears throat> can only be utilized if the tenant is current in the payment of rent and utilities. Um, and I, it's an area, it's a, it's a part of the law that just makes no sense to me why a landlord should be off the hook from needing to um, provide a habitable unit if a tenant is behind $1 in rent. Um, but the way that the statutes are written, these statutory options can only be utilized if a tenant is current in rent. If that is the case, they have some options. None of them are ideal. A lot of them put the burden on the tenant when it seems like this is something where the burden should be on the landlord immediately, but there are some options. The first is called what we call repair and deduct, where they can either hire a licensed professional or if they feel like they have the ability to repair uh, the defect themselves, they can get the, the defect repaired and then deduct the cost of that from the next month's rent. And that's important that it's not that they need to be current, you know, when they give their written notice saying to the landlord, this is what needs to be um, repaired. And at the end of the, the time frame that they need to wait, um, they still need to be you know, current with, the, with, the, with their rent. And then when they get the repairs done, can deduct that only from the next month's rent. They can't withhold it ahead of time saying this is going to go to um, to these repairs. And that's really cost prohibitive for a lot of tenants. And that's you know, another a tough part uh, of why these remedies um, are available, but uh, just really are, are difficult for a lot of tenants to, to make use of. Uh, the last one I have here, they have the right, the landlord misses the window to begin um, the repairs to terminate the rental agreement without any further obligation and move out. Now, of course, that's not ideal for a lot of tenants, but for some that may be, um, you know, exactly what they're looking for it might be the best case scenario for them, um, particularly because, you know, they can strategize and plan about um, making sure they will have a new place to be before taking these, uh, these steps. Um, and if a, a unit has, you know, for months and months been had issues that a landlord's not you know, not repairing and seems, you know, completely unwilling to repair. And and the tenant thinks, you know, this is never going to be a good situation for me. I need to find new housing and is able to do so. Um, then, you know, strategizing about when to then put in the final written notice if they haven't already, wait the amount of time for whatever kind of repair it is, and then send another written notice saying, you know, I am taking advantage of my right to terminate this rental agreement without further, any further obligations. So it can be in the middle of a year lease term um, and they don't have you know, any further obligations under it. Um, that is something that, that some tenants, you know, it, it is advantageous to them to be able to take advantage of that. Although for many, you know, finding new housing is such a huge barrier that that may not be something that, that's meaningfully, that's a meaningful rent remedy for them. Um, one thing that I haven't put on here, but I wanna bring up is the ability to call code enforcement, uh, local code enforcement, if a place is so uh, is is uninhabitable, um, you know, due to a sewage issue, a huge hole in a wall or ceiling, um, you know, a huge leak that's not being addressed. Um, code enforcement, you know, seems like an appealing kind of way to get you know a government agency involved and say you know get the landlord to to take uh, a repair seriously. Um, there, there are pros and cons, and, and the pros I've covered, the con is that um, the danger there is that if code enforcement comes out and has to then declare a unit fully uninhabitable based on what they find, 
then that land then that tenant has to be out you know very very quickly and so they have some remedies about um what they are owed from a landlord um when that happens some some assistance to find new housing and that's that's written into the law but realistically getting the landlord to fork over the cash that quickly doesn't always happen and so it can be a case where you have the right to this kind of assistance from your landlord when your place was declared uninhabitable but you're you struggle to get it you have to go to small claims court or you have to pursue some other kind of way to actually get that money and in the meantime you very quickly need another place to be um, and, and and you may not have the financial assistance to do that. And so that's something to always keep in mind uh, when you're you know, considering recommending a person call code enforcement. Okay, the landlord's right to entry. Hey Matt, can I, mm -hmm. in, can I interrupt you? Cause I, I dropped a Please couple do. questions into the chat that um, have come up in our clinic around repairs. Mm -hmm. One is whether there's any exception to the requirement right now that the tenant be current in rent due to COVID. Mm -hmm. There hasn't and, been anything in, in a moratorium or any other kind of um, law at this point that has that has adjusted that requirement okay. um, for the remedies that are in the RLTA, unfortunately. Yeah, that's a real bummer. <laughs> We're definitely, definitely seeing a lot of um, questions about uh, about repairs and, you know, lots of folks not able to pay rent. But second part of, or se I guess, sort of an outgrowth of that question is, can you talk a little bit about mold or bed bugs and where they fit into these repairs, timelines or remedies? And I know that the RLTA is, is silent on them specifically. And so, you know, um, so there aren't, you know, specific testing requirements for mold, um, things like that. So I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about like what actually happens in practice. Yeah, absolutely. For clients who I have, uh, have who are experiencing mold or bed bugs, um, we, we argue that it falls within this all other cases, 10 day time frame for a landlord to, to correct the issue. This is one of those tricky cases, again, where a landlord making an effort to correct the issue you know, can, they can argue that that is, you know, they're doing their duty there. And so often, you know, in the case of, you know, bed bugs, uh, in a serious case, there, there may be, you know, a kind of chemical treatment, you know, that would, that would be very costly for the landlord and take a lot of time that might actually be required. And a landlord might instead, you know, have an exterminator come and perform some more like surface level treatment that's unlikely to really, um, fix the issue permanently and you may see bed bugs popping back up but they may you know try to argue if you're trying to tell them you know no I'm taking I want to take advantage of these remedies I have under the RLTA they may say well you know with the time frame I, I tried to correct the issue and and that's where it, it get it can get really sticky um, you know none of these remedies are are ideal unfortunately and and so many of them just the tenants are, are more likely to, uh, unfortunately, be able to try to collect some kind of um, repayment for for like a diminished value argument of the rental and the time they were in it after they're able to be out somewhere else than they are to meaningfully use these remedies to get landlords to fix issues when landlords are just extremely resistant and just feel like they, you know, are just you know, going to give like surface level um, treatment um, or or just, you know, or just believe it to be the, the tenant's issue. Um, that comes up in bed bugs a lot, unfortunately, because if a, if, if it's reasonable to believe that the tenant themselves cause an infestation, that can relieve a landlord of their duty to then uh, be financially responsible for treatment. And, and so it's complicated. It can take some kind of, um, advocacy, some creative advocacy, um, um, self-advocacy by tenants and with the assistance of attorneys where that's available um, to try to, you know, use the weight of the, the relationship and and um, and the advocacy that attorney can bring to to create change that maybe under the law, technically a landlord could try to, you know, escape from, um, or, or argue they're they're not uh, they are fulfilling their duties. Um, I'm certainly happy to to speak with uh, attorneys individually if you're you know 
you're uh, helping clients who have repair issues, bed bugs, mold about, you know, more in depth about what has and hasn't worked as far as, you know, things like what kind of testing for mold and, and what kind of, yeah, I'm, I, I could go into a lot of detail, um, but certainly just reach out to, uh, to me if you want to talk about, you know, what I've seen um, in practice, uh, what strategies might be a little bit more successful and, and just depending on the individual circumstances of your client, what kind of tough conversations you may need to have um, about what, what's realistic for them. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, Denise. And feel free to interrupt if other questions are in the chat because I've realized that the way I've set my screen up, I'm not seeing them at the moment. Yeah, will do. Thanks. Let me do a time check, where are we at? We are at five minutes to two, so you have about 25 minutes left. Okay, great. And I definitely want, and I think I'll be able to give you some time, but I'm just going to move a little bit more quickly then because I spent more time on this section than I intended. I'll leave some slides in, but I'll cover very, very quickly about the landlord's right to entry, generally two days written notice, except in the case of an emergency. Landlords cannot retaliate against tenants, require them to waive their rights. A list of things that landlords cannot do here, but like I was saying earlier, will do and then the question is what's the remedy unfortunately for a lot of times it's a lot of times it's a remedy that reaches back more than it is a remedy that can get a landlord to actually change their behavior um, getting a, a person who doesn't want to follow the law to do so just because you say here's what the law says it can be tricky and so um, it, it's often a case of looking back and trying to get um, a tenant um, compensated for what they deserved while they were in the rental but didn't receive um, one quick point I should make about um, uh, this in this section is I know that when I started my instinct in so many cases where a landlord wasn't doing their duties was, well, I'll just get that landlord on the phone and explain the law to them and tell them, you know, what they need to be doing for their tenant and, and you know, and that'll certainly make things better. I realized quickly that it was very important to have conversations with clients about what their relationships with their landlords look like and the possibility of an attorney getting involved or even a tenant you know being too aggressive or assertive and standing up for their rights might do to that relationship in ways that the landlord you know then might act out that much more which of course is awful to think about and is illegal that landlords you know legally can't retaliate against tenants for standing up for their rights does that mean that it never happens? No. And then, you know, is a client then in a position where they're defending against an unlawful detainer action that has no merit, but the landlord filed it because they got upset. And that means that the landlord or the tenant has to spend time seeking out an attorney again, responding to the court paperwork, possibly appearing in court. Um, you know, even if they win, you know, that's not much of a victory. It's just defending against the landlord's further retaliatory action. And so it, it's unfortunate to have to, to, really have those kind of conversations with clients too about what here's the types of advocacy that are available for us to take you individually or us together um, and here's you know the possible pros of that and here are the cons considering that their individual relationship with their landlords um, you know particularly for folks who may feel that their their landlords may have reason to um, yeah, to, to not treat them the way they would treat other tenants because of their gender identity or sexual orientation. And so those are, those are tough conversations, um, but, but necessary ones I've learned. Um, here are the, the sources of law, and I wanna point out that Washington Law Help, um, the webpage put on by the Northwest Justice Project has a lot of helpful information uh, self-help information for tenants. Another site here, uh, the Tenants Union of Washington has a great Know Your Rights webpage as well that are very good resources for tenants, also for attorneys to, you know, quickly review, uh, you know, some of the more niche areas of law, that, to, of housing law, um, and, and uh, pamphlets that we hope are very, like, straightforward and provide the information in plain language. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about now fair housing. Um, this is in such an important uh, consideration for people working with, with LGBTQ plus clients. Um, and I want to talk about um, agencies that can help um, um, enforce fair housing law and other kind of remedies that people have who might be f facing retaliation or discrimination. Uh, I put in some language here just to note again that who is protected is a little bit different from <clears throat> the, the landlord tenant, the Residential Landlord Tenant Act. Uh, particularly, I want to note at the bottom here that protections, unfortunately, may not apply to landlords who rent fewer than single, uh, three single-family homes 
or who live in the dwelling with the tenant. And that doesn't mean that discrimination is legal against those kinds of tenants, but it just means that the remedies under the fair housing laws um, may not be available. I put the full list here of Washington state protected classes, sexual orientation and gender identity fall within that, but I put the full list because of how for many of our clients, um, they may ident intersect with other protected classes um, and particularly um, how <clears throat> it can be a consideration when, when fighting against discrimination by a landlord that if it's more difficult to pinpoint um, that that discrimination is occurring because of sexual orientation or gender identity, even when a tenant knows that it is, um, <clears throat> but it might be easier to pinpoint um, a way that it's intersecting with um, with an, another with membership in another protected class such as disability, um, national origin, uh, and so things to keep in mind there. The discriminator discriminatory housing practices that are banned uh, under these laws are refusal to sell, rent, or negotiate for a rental, uh, applying any kind of different terms, conditions, or privilege, privileges that are not being placed on other tenants, um, to explicitly advertise any kind of preference, limitation, or discrimination, uh, to misrepresent the availability uh, of a rental to a person uh, based on their membership in a protected class, any other kind of interference, coercion, or intimidation, or otherwise is making a dwelling unavailable to a person because of a member their membership in a protected class. I also want to note here that um, domestic violence um, can be argued uh, is sex discrimination in many, many cases, but because there are even you know, more explicit remedies, um, I want to point out for any of our clients who may be experiencing domestic violence that the Residential Landlord Tenant Act has some existing DV protections in it uh, to be able to terminate a lease early without any further penalty to change the locks um, and other local protections um, also exist. And so I'll, I'll quickly mention those even though we we could talk about those in more depth, uh, but if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Also note that some subsidized tenancies are covered by the Violence Against Women Act, and that would have some remedies that go even farther than those that are found under the Fair Housing Act. And I'll quickly mention too that for um, our tenants with um, disabilities, uh, the reasonable accommodation that is available and required to be given by landlords um, in, in housing law, uh, that would be any kind of reasonable change in a rule, policy, practice, or service when those accommodations may be necessary to afford a person with a disability the ability uh, to use and enjoy the dwelling equally. And disability isn't um, defined very concretely, you know, with any kind of you know, particular list or, or requirement. And so um, certainly if, if there's any way to be able to tie a person's impairment, whether physical or mental, um, to to the need for a reasonable change in a rule or policy, um, then, then a tenant should be able to, to ask for that. And where there is no significant financial burden on the landlord to provide that, um, they are required by law uh, to provide that. And so some examples are um, uh, explaining what is in the rental agreement if for whatever reason a person might have um, an impairment that prevents them from, from understanding. Certainly waiving fees for emotional support animals or service dogs, uh, providing notices in larger fonts, transferring a, a, a tenant from an upstairs unit to the ground floor, early release from a rental agreement without penalty, um, uh, waiving screening policies based on disability related contact, uh, conduct and permitting a, a live-in aid. Um, I want to hurry over to my slide on uh, thinking about these in COVID related terms uh, during, during COVID in particular. Um, these can be based on, again, any kind of disability impairment that can be tied to a need for a change in rules, but can also be argued um, to be uh, up to apply to people uh, for fear of acquiring COVID, um, particularly to people who might be uh, immunocompromised or to um, people who, for whatever reason, would be unable to be vaccinated. Um, certainly, this is a good time to be advocating for tenants um, to be to for any kind of um, uh, changes in, in rules or policies, especially rules around entry or um, the way that they pay, um, or even um, being able to, to move out uh, of a unit. Uh, if they're going to be able to find ho housing that would be safer for them elsewhere uh, early in the middle of a lease, or alternatively to be able to continue to stay 
um, even past um, maybe when the moratorium would allow them uh, not to be evicted, but have more time to move um, if, they, if they've gotten a proper notice that tells them their tenancy is going to be ending and they need more time uh, specifically because of uh, accommodations or, uh, related to, to COVID-19. Uh, enforcement agencies for um, for fair housing. Uh, I've got them listed here uh, for your reference, and I'm sure the slides will be sent out um, uh, when you're working. I feel like the, the more local, the better. And so you're working with tenants in Seattle, uh, the Seattle Office for Civil Rights is going to be um, possibly the most responsive um, to, to clients who are, are facing uh, discriminatory practices. Um, all right, I think I'll move on to the last section I have. Yeah, I'll try to wrap this up within about five minutes, Denise, and leave time for you. Uh, two new bills um, this year that uh, create some, some additional protections for tenants uh, that are important to know about. Uh, the first House Bill 1236 limits the way the landlord can end a tenancy. So previously, a landlord ha was able to end a month-to-month -month situation if a tenant had a one-year lease and then moved month-to-month -month after that. A landlord could give them a 20-day notice uh, before the end of a month without needing a single reason and just saying, this is the end of your tenancy, you need to be out, or else they could face eviction. And that's no longer available to landlords. Um, and so landlords must now give 60 day days notice if they want to let a fixed term tenancy expire without extending it. So that's still the situation where a tenant gets a one year lease term. And, you know, it says this is from, um, you know, September 2021 to, to August 2022. And you're reaching the end of that lease term. Now a landlord can give 60 days notice to say this was the only lease term I'm going to give to you. And that now expires and a tenant would have to move. But otherwise, if it moves month to month, a landlord must now have good cause to end that tenancy. I've noted in here that there's a three month conversion period after the moratorium expires. And so many landlords may be trying to take advantage of this period to get month to month tenants back into a new one year tenancy with the hope that they could then ride out that one year and then give them the 60 day notice ending uh, that tenancy at the end of that year. And so um, definitely reach out to me if you have any questions. You see clients coming to you saying, my landlord suddenly wants me to sign a new lease. I've been month to month for five years. Why would I sign a new lease now? It might be related to this and we can talk about what strategies they have. Because otherwise in month to month situations, landlords must now have good cause. Now good cause is a, a bit of a loose term. You know, some, it, some good cause would be where the tenant's at fault, you know, still failing to pay rent when the moratorium expires or violating rules um, uh, application fraud. Others are where the tenant though is not at fault, but is still defined to be good cause. So that would be where the owner is selling the property or wants to move back into the property. They now have the ability to give a 90 day notice uh, that they're selling the property and that would be considered good cause. There's one kind of leftover broad term legitimate business reason that I, uh, tenant advocates certainly don't love being in there we may have to you know, have a lot of fights over what's a legitimate business reason if landlords are kind of trying to use that you know, potential loophole to look out for. Um, so as this is a changing landscape, landlords you know, are certainly having to learn it the same way that tenants are. Um, so never assume that a landlord, that a, that a notice that comes from a landlord trying to end a tenancy right now is interpreting these new rules correctly um, without you know, looking into, this, into the, the bills, asking other uh, attorneys who are practicing housing law regularly about uh, how these are being interpreted. Um, <clears throat> and I did note here that this bill specifically gives tenants the right to sue if wrongfully evicted and collect damages. The other bill is Senate Bill 5160. It gives some renters additional protections post COVID. So for any rent that was owed between March 2020 and six months after the expiration of the moratorium. So that would be, let's see, December, uh, the end of December, 2021, a landlord can't charge or impose any late fees for non-payment of rent that accrued during that period and cannot report non-payment of rent to a prospective landlord. So if a, land, if a tenant has moved out with a debt but is looking for new housing and the old landlord um, is going to call previous landlords for recommend, uh, referrals, uh, the, the prior landlord can't report uh, non-payment of rent during that period 
to the new landlord as a way of saying, don't rent to this person. A prospective landlord also can't take any kind of adverse action against a tenant based on non-payment of rent from this period if they found out about it on their own in any other way or if a tenant volunteered it. Um, a pr prospective landlord cannot use that as a reason not to rent to them. And landlords <coughs> uh, or prospective landlords can't inquire about or take any adverse action based on a tenant's medical history, including but not limited to COVID exposure. Um, and this can be particularly helpful for um, clients who would not want to um, disclose um, <clears throat> any kind of status about their ability to, to get vaccinated. Um, uh, if they had a particular, um, if they were immunocompromised or had other reasons um, th that they need to be protective about their, limit, uh, their exposure to, to COVID, um, it, it takes off the board uh, the ability for landlords or prospective landlords to, to take adverse action based on a tenant's medical history. The last thing I'll cover real quick is repayment plans and rental assistance. Uh, repayment plans have been made mandatory for any unpaid rent, again, from March 2020 through December 2021. It must be reasonable, though that's up for interpretation. It's partly, certainly part of what we'll be doing as tenant advocates to, uh, to argue is, is really based on individual circumstances and not just a, a, any kind of baseline. But one cap that's been put on it is it can't exceed one third of monthly rent. Um, and they must allow payment from any source. They can't discriminate based on where the assistance may be coming from. Uh, the first payment is not due until can't be due until 30 days after offered and must only include rent, no late fees, attorney's fees, other charges. I've listed here, and you can certainly reach out to me for more information about these, the county and state programs that are available for rental assistance right now and a little bit about their criteria, but certainly um, <clears throat> feel free to reach out to me for, for more information about how those are working because I know that a lot of tenants, that's their, that's their most pressing question right now is where can I get rent help? And I believe that's the end of my slides. Here's um, some information, my information, if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to be a resource. I'm happy to uh, use other resources that I have to get answers to your questions that I don't know. Um, I, again, I'm sorry about rushing through a lot of information here, but I hope that this was helpful. And if there are any questions in the chat, uh, Denise, feel free to let me know, or anybody wants to unmute and ask, um, they can do the same. Thanks, Matt. We have not, oh, we did get a question in the chat. Are short-term rentals covered by the RLTA, the Residential Landlord Tenant Act? Yes, there's no requirement that um, that a rental agreement, you know, be for a year or a certain period. And so shorter-term rentals um, could still be covered. Cool. Um, well, I'm going to pivot and talk just a little bit about unhoused um, LGBTQ folks and some of the common issues there. Um, Matt, do you mind unsharing your screen? Thank you. Um, and um, just adjust my view here. Okay. Um, there is a question in the chat about whether mobile homes are covered by a separate act from the RLTA. I'm very pleased with myself because I do actually know the answer to that question. And the answer is yes, they have their own law. <laughs> um, yep, and Denise, I'll was, add real quickly, that's for yeah. um, people who own their mobile homes and are, are renting the lot space. Uh, if a person rents a mobile home from, the other, from somebody else who owns it, uh, they will be under the RLTA. Oh, good to know. Thank you. I did not know that that distinction. Awesome. So um, a couple of things that I'll say as we um, as we pivot um, to our next um, before we pivot to our next ses session um, is just to to kind of give a little bit of additional context for some of the things that Matt talked about in terms of what we see in our legal clinic. One of the things that we have seen um, increasingly over the last year and a half is that ending a lease or moving is a really big deal for tenants. And so I think that, you know, a lot of what Matt was talking about, um, and I really appreciated, Matt, how you really laid out, like, we have this law, and it really assumes good faith on the part of landlords and really is not, it's not written in a way that right sizes or gives equality to the remedies available to tenants versus the remedies available to landlords. Um, you know, it is, which is sort of a fancy way of saying it is 10 times harder for a tenant to use these laws to remedy something going wrong than it is for a landlord to use the same laws to evict a tenant, to um, 
or to, you know, do something outside of the law because it's just so hard for a tenant to enforce. So this is an area of law where the power dynamics are particularly um, are particularly out of sync. Um, and, and I guess I say all of that just to say that, you know, when I first started advising at clinics, a lot of my approach was like, well, if your landlord isn't going to, you know, fix this repair, you can break your lease, right? And, you know, it, I sort of, you know, or like, don't be afraid to break your lease because yes, there are consequences, but your landlord also has obligations and duties in that scenario. And I think what I was missing in that is how hard it is for a tenant to relocate. Um, you know, it is incredibly costly to find a new place to live. It's incredibly costly to move. Um, and it is something that folks just don't have the resources to do. And so in that sense, like landlords tend to hold a lot of power over the day-to-day -day sort of human existence of their tenants, because if they don't fix the leaking sink and it just continues to leak or, you know, one of our clinic clients came to us and said, you know, I could never figure out why my bathroom was so cold. I looked underneath my, like, I looked in my sink cabinet and I realized there's a hole to the outside, right? Like there was literally a hole in the wall in their, in their bathroom sink cabinet. And, you know, that's something that the landlord should repair and they never did. And, you know, and they, and, you know, if the landlord isn't going to do something, then suddenly this person is in a position of having to say, do I live with this very cold bathroom or do I make a big deal out of this and find a new place to live? And is that actually like a lot of times the tenants just sort of find themselves in a situation where they have to they have to do the thing that, you know, that is inconvenient and unfair because there isn't a better option. Um, so to to talk just a little bit about houselessness and you can kind of see how this turns, you know, how this turns into houselessness, right? Because you end up in these situations where there's um, a power imbalance with the landlord, a landlord doesn't make um, a situation habitable, a person can't keep up with, you know, these new payment plans that essentially raise everybody's rent 30% to make up for not being able to pay. Um, it's not like people magically getting access to funds. Um, many of the, the funds distribution networks are not up and running yet. Um, and so you can kind of see how it lends itself to houselessness. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about what some of the rights are available to tenants. I did not do a PowerPoint on this, I'm sorry, but we do have a very robust um, guide on this. It's a 15 or 16 page guide um, on our education and resources page, and I'll drop a link to it in the chat as well. Um, so the, the most important thing for you to know is that houselessness is a real problem for LGBTQ people um, and that King County actually has the highest number of unhoused non-binary people in the country. Um, we are tied with Los Angeles County. Um, and, um, and houselessness is all about trauma, right? Because it forces you out of having a stable place, a stable place to keep your belongings, having privacy, having stability. Um, and often it can manifest in our communities because we have patterns of community care. Um, it can manifest in our communities in the form of things like um, in the form of things like couch surfing, living in vehicles, things like that. Um, and so, um, so that is something to kind of be aware of that, you know, we may be talking to folks at our clinic that experience houselessness. I am on camera, babe. Um, <laughs> oh. You may be encountering folks who are experiencing houselessness um, or who are living in cars, things like that, but it's not like they're living in shelters. So there's a lot of in-between space there. Um, the most important thing I wanna say about shelter access for LGBTQ people is that shelters are public accommodations. That means that they cannot turn anyone away on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. And it means that gender identity is interpreted by the person's presentation and what they're not even, excuse me, I shouldn't even say their presentation. It is determined by how the person identifies their gender and what is the right fit for them. So you can imagine why non-binary people are more likely to be unhoused and unsheltered because so many of our, our shelter systems are sex segregated. 
But um, the important thing to know is that they are public accommodations and that um, when we talk to folks who are navigating the shelter system, that we really drive home that they have the right to self-identify where they're going to be housed um, based on what their gender, the, you know, their lived and experienced gender is. Um, that's also true for people who are living in supported housing. We talk to a lot of folks who are living in housing that is like reentry supported housing. So it might be, you know, a place that they live immediately after exiting the, the Department of Corrections, or it might be um, psychiatric or sober housing. Um, so lots of different forms of, of protective housing or supportive housing um, that are often sex segregated and are often run by nonprofits. So all of those are, um, are important things to keep in mind. Those are also rights that, um, that LGBTQ people have, regardless of whether the shelter provider is a religious entity or not. Um, religious entities provide 41% of the um, homeless services in our country. So they have a big, um, a big part of, you know, a big part of homeless services. Um, they're a big part of that service area. Um, that doesn't mean that every faith-based provider is not going to be LGBTQ affirming. There are many that are. Um, there are also many that have very limited um, limited belief systems around sexual orientation and gender identity, and um, and that we um, you know we need to really be aware of. And you know, again, I, I always come back to. Our communities are smart, right? We don't. We know how to take care of ourselves. We don't go places where we are not wanted unless we absolutely must. Um, and so that is something to to just kind of keep in mind that folks do tend to experience really high rates of discrimination in the shelter system. Um, so it is two twenty one. I want to give us a quick stretch break before we move into our final session. So I'm going to give us until two twenty five. Um, and then we will pivot to our final presentation, which is going to be really fantastic. I'm really excited about it. Um, we have Cecil Whitney and Megan Dawson. Cecil is with the Northwest Network um, provide, that provides um, survivor advocacy services to LGBTQ folks who are survivors of violence. Um, and Megan Dawson, who is an attorney with the Lavender Rights Project doing family law. Um, and they're going to talk about some of the intersections of how we can support survivors in our work because we serve a lot of survivors. So um, take about uh, four more minutes. Um, we'll be back here at 2.25. Thank you.